welcome to the BPD Bunch Brunch, where we get together with our favorite brunchy beverages to catch up, play games, and talk about all things BPD. I'm your host, Sani, and today I'm here with Alex. Where in the world are you coming from, and what's your brunchy beverage? I am in New York City, and I am drinking a good old English breakfast tea. Ooh, I'm coming from New Mexico in the United States, and I... I'm drinking cucumber water. It's just water with cucumbers in it. Nice. Today we're going to be adding on to our conversation about the favorite person. If this and other BPD topics interest you, please make sure to like, subscribe, and turn on your notifications so that you do not miss anything. So Alex is a PhD candidate in clinical psychology, and today she's going to be sharing her tips and tricks for managing all things favorite person. So what do you want to start with? I thought it would be a good idea to start with a few simple ideas just to kind of lay the groundwork because the things I'm going to talk about today you might hear and think like this is incredibly difficult and how am I going to do this or this is ridiculous, this is not going to work. I want you to keep in mind the concept of willingness, which is really just fully being willing and open to experiencing or doing something new, doing something different, something that might be scary, that might feel uncomfortable. A lot of these things I'm going to talk about are going to feel maybe opposite to your nature. And it's really important to just be willing. Change only comes from a place where you are willing to make that change. You have to actually make those changes to see changes happen. So there are no specific treatments for the favorite person. I mean, we can target a lot of the issues that are involved in favorite person relationships through treatment in general. But I've kind of tried to come up with like a number of different skills that I could think of pulling from DBT, um, more mentalization based treatment and kind of rooted in some more attachment theory um, to help kind of think about ways that we can reduce or manage different aspects of the favorite person relationship. So I've kind of broken things down into like three different categories or aspects of this experience. So the first one being preventing a relationship from becoming a favorite person attachment managing a favorite person relationship, and then, you know, being able to cope with the end of a favorite person relationship. So I really wanted to start with preventing a relationship from becoming a favorite person attachment. Um, I've talked a lot about how I view the favorite person as like an external identity. A lot of times, one of the ultimate goals of recovery and BPD is being able to find oneself, find one sense of self, building your own identity. And When the favorite person starts to become someone who you're relying on for a sense of who you are and, and, you know, external source of identity, I think one of the major antidotes to that would be building your sense of self, um, building that for yourself, a unique sense of self that's not reliant on someone else. When you're in a place where you don't have a favorite person or, or you're just starting to realize maybe you're developing a favorite person relationship, really focusing on yourself, we can find a sense of self by by figuring out our values and goals. And if you don't really know exactly what you want, even in a relationship or what you want for yourself, I think it's a really good thing to figure out what your values are, figure out what you want from a relationship with another person before really entering into that. Do you have specific tips on things people can do to really work on that sense of identity and finding their own values? Yeah, I mean, there are a number of like values worksheets online. And I know it might sound kind of silly for some people to do worksheets. I, you know, full disclosure, I think worksheets are kind of silly sometimes, but if it's something that's your own self-exploration, it can be really helpful. I've seen, you know, a lot of clients talking about how figuring out what's important to them is like one of the first steps, something that's like deeply ingrained, important to you, um, to your core. And then figuring out from there, you can start figuring out your goals and what you want in life, how you might want to show up for other people in relationships too. So you can do things like that and doing the best you can to live according to those values. And figuring out your values doesn't necessarily mean you're going to like have a completely solid sense of who you are. Um, I think a lot of having a sense of self comes from like having also self-esteem, which a lot of people with BPD don't have. And it's a lot of self-criticism and a lot of judgment. And when your emotions are dysregulated, a lot of the time it might feel chaotic. Life feels chaotic. So who you are feels chaotic. It might feel like very confusing who you are because you might be acting very differently in different situations. 
one of the ways in clinical psychology that we view identity as kind of building and becoming what's called a consolidated identity um, is through being able to regulate your emotions better. The values thing is something you can do short term and like start to work on, but the emotion regulation piece is obviously more difficult. Like I, th I think it is absolutely possible to be able to regulate your emotions. And that is one of the areas in research where we see that like symptoms really improve a lot faster than some of the other symptoms. In DBT, it's like the idea is like once you are able to regulate your emotions, the identity piece follows because when your emotions are all over the place, like when you're feeling like they're, your feelings are really extreme and it's hard to feel like you have a consistent sense of self over time and across space. So once you're able to re regulate better, it's easier to develop like a more consistent sense of who you are. Then I want to talk about skills like when you're starting to enter a relationship with someone, it's really important important to do a number of different things to prevent that from becoming a favorite person or like intense, strong attachment relationships so quickly. And a few things I think were really helpful are trying to keep yourself busy with things that you enjoy, making sure that you're nurturing other relationships or seeking out other relationships as well. So a lot of like accumulating positives in the short term, like doing things for yourself, making sure that you're busy so that you're not necessarily only wanting to be with this person. Or maybe even if you want to be with this person all the time, you're busy and like you, you are committing to other things so that you can't be with this person all the time. Another thing too is acting opposite, like a lot of opposite action to wanting to be with them all the time, to wanting to get close like so fast, making sure you're taking things slowly. And this is where this whole, like what I was saying earlier about it not feeling like it's part of your nature it's going to take a lot of willingness, a lot of being like, okay, I am, I want to be with them so badly right now. I want to see them every day, but I'm not going to, I'm only going to allow myself to see them a few times a week, or I'm only going to allow myself to text them X amount of times and like to really limit communication. And like, you know, when you jump into a really relationship so fast, a lot of times you don't fully get to know the person as a full person. So you know, we talk a lot about idealizing people and viewing them as all good. A lot of times our minds can, we meet someone, we think that they're so amazing and our minds start to fill in the blanks of things that we don't know about this person. They become really amazing. And when you're going so fast in a relationship, it's hard to stop that and to slow down, you know, and to, to really like get to know them. So then if something happens and like that image of them is shattered, it's devastating. So going slow is so important. And that's really where opposite action and willingness comes in, because it might feel like in every ounce of your body that you just want to be close to them and want to be with them and want to talk to them. But really like checking yourself in a way and saying like, is this going to be helpful for me? Is this going to be beneficial? What is opposite action? Opposite action is basically just acting opposite to whatever urge that you're feeling that's coming up from an, any given emotion that you're having. So a lot of times with favorite person relationship, you might have a strong feeling of love. You want to be with them all the time. You know, uh, you just want to be around them. And acting opposite to that would be limiting your communication. You don't need to distance yourself completely from this person. But, you know, taking a step back instead of wanting like that all encompassing love, letting it develop more slowly. You know, one of the things that occurs to me while you're talking is that you know, there is an aspect of like when you meet a new person that there there's some like natural excitement and inclination to want to spend time with them. I am now at a point where I am, you know, able to, you know, like, yes, yeah, sometimes I'll spend more time than I ordinarily would with someone um, when they're like a new friend or I'm excited about them being in my life. But I'm also more aware now of when that excitement can turn into something problematic. I guess the question is, like, would you recommend that, you know, if you're at a point where you're not as good at differentiating them between those things, that that's why it would be better to err on the side of caution? I think absolutely. I mean, I think it's a hard thing to hear, um, especially when you don't want to do that. But it doesn't even need to necessarily be like erring on the side of caution. It can just be like, I'm going to do these other things for myself. Like I'm still going to go to my running club or I'm still going to go to my knitting club, you know, like getting involved with other things that are for you that you enjoy doing and like still sticking to that and doing that. And I think that's healthy for any relationship. I think in life we need to have balanced relationships. It's a lot to put on one 
person and to put all your energy into one person. No matter what, if you are starting to realize that like all you want to do is be with this one person to just try just to make sure that you're doing other things. So like not canceling other plans that you've made yeah. already. Yeah, not canceling other not canceling other plans. Making don't clear sure your schedule just plans. for this person. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Don't make yourself like super available for them all the time. Um, you know, you are your own person. You don't have to live for someone else. Something that might be a sign that you're starting to enter into a favorite person territory is like you're starting to do things that maybe you wouldn't normally want to do just to be with another person. Maybe starting to let go of some of your values. So those are things to be aware of. Um, maybe you're, one of your values is friendships and you want you like really pride yourself on being a good friend but then you start putting all of your energy into the favorite person and you start realizing oh I haven't really spoken to some of my friends lately really try to make sure that okay you're you are still acting according to your values because we can drop everything to want to be with a favorite person yeah you're talking about friendships and I'm just remembering times that I've it's not even just dropping them but the only thing I ever want to talk about with them is the favorite is my favorite person it's like I hardly spend time with you. And when I do, I'm just going to talk about this other person and not ask you about yourself at all. Yeah. I mean, I'm imagining how that's going to make them feel. And that's something too. And something I, I want to talk about as we move into the next set of skills, which is like managing the favorite person relationship too, is like a big part of that is being able to empathize other people, whether or not it's like the favorite person or your friends that you're talking to about your favorite person all the time. Um, being able to understand like how you, how are you impacting how is your behavior impacting someone else? So I'm going to move on to then managing a favorite person relationship and how to do that. Um, and I think a lot of the ones that we talked about when we talked about preventing the favorite person attachment from developing also are very much in play here. Um, opposite action again, so acting opposite to your urges. This might be even in a different way. So like a lot of times when people are in favorite person relationships, they talk about having a lot of jealousy, um, a lot of jealousy about the other person's relationship, maybe feeling like someone's going to get in the way of your relationship with a person or threatening that relationship. So that's a really important thing too. completely acting opposite to that. So some of the the different opposite actions for jealousy that are outlined through DBT, um, one of them is like letting go of controlling other people's actions or sharing the things and people you have in your life. So that's really important. It could feel really hard to share the people you have in your life with other people. It might feel really territorial, like mine, this is mine. And when your fear of abandonment is heightened and there's another person in the picture taking away either their attention from you or the amount of time they can spend with you, the jealousy can be intense, can even be like a lot of anger that might come up too. So like acting opposite to anger as well you know, trying to really understand another person's perspective. I've struggled in the past with opposite action because sometimes I'm putting myself in situations that seem like they're beyond my skill level. And I like, I tell myself, this is how I'm going to behave in this situation. I know this emotion is going to come up and I'm going to do this instead. But then I end up kind of being over my head and the emotion gets really intense. What kinds of skills would you recommend implementing when like the the emotion that you're trying to act in opposition to threatens to sort of overwhelm you? Mm, it's a good question. Skills to really regulate first, to really tolerate very distressing feelings. So when your emotions, let's say, are like eight out of 10 or higher, you should like, you should really use skills to first calm yourself down to regulate your emotions a little bit more before it's, it's because it can be very difficult to, like you said, to act opposite um when you're so angry jealous whatever it is um so i mean there's a number of skills my favorite one is tipping the body temperature you know submerging your face in like a bucket of ice water for 30 seconds and holding your breath it really just calms your nervous system it activates what's called the dive reflex um, which really just slows down all your bodily functions, including your heart rate and your fight or flight mode, which is usually activated when, let's say, for example, you're fearing abandonment, you're, you're feeling really afraid that someone's going to leave you at a given moment. And it might lead to behaviors like begging or crying or doing certain things that maybe you wouldn't normally do. Those are good signs. Like if you feel like doing those things, those are good signs that your emotions are really heightened and that you should probably use a tip skill. 
I love the tip skill. Sticking my face in cold water is one of my favorite things of all time. And one of the, one of the like pushbacks that I've gotten is like, well, you know, that's easy to do if you're at home, but if you're not at home, like, what do you do? So mm -hmm. I guess my question is like when, you know, a bowl of cold water is not easily accessible, what would your second go-to be? I would probably say breathing. So there's paced breathing um, in DBT where they talk about, you know, breathing out for longer than you're breathing in. So let's say breathing in for five seconds and out for seven. Um, that also really calms what's called your vagus nerve and really calms your nervous system. Um, when you're breathing and if you're fully focusing on your breathing, it's hard to focus on anything else. I mean, it might be really hard to get yourself to focus on your breathing, but when you're forcing yourself to breathe in that way, it really does help. Um, you know, I've seen it happen in front of my eyes where someone's had like maybe, maybe even a panic attack is coming on and just telling them to breathe and focus on their breathing and you can just see it subside. Um, so that's a really big thing. You can do that absolutely anywhere. Yeah. Focusing on the numbers, I think really helps like counting like one, two, three, four, because it's hard to keep track of numbers and think about something yeah. else at the same time. Yeah. That's true. Like you really, we can only have a certain amount of things in our mind at one time. So if you're focusing on numbers, it's much better than focusing on how bad you feel. Another thing that comes up in favorite person relationships that makes them sometimes really difficult to manage is our ability to mentalize. And mentalize, mentalizing is the ability to understand what's going on in yourself in terms of your feelings and your thoughts and your desires and your motivations, and also to understand those things about another person, to understand what's going on in their minds. When people with BPD are in relationships, especially very close attachment relationships, um, with especially with their favorite person, you are likely to over-mentalize. It's called hyper-mentalizing, where you are assuming what's going on in someone else's mind and making assumptions about what's going on in someone else's mind. Like, you're mad at me. You hate me. You know, you don't want to be around me. So that can happen a lot. Maybe you don't get a text back from someone and you start to assume all the reasons why they're never going to talk to you again. You really want to be able to mentalize here. And to be able to mentalize, you have to really pay attention to what's going on yourself. Be curious. Is this, is this coming from me? Is this coming? Like, what is it that's making me think this about them? Um, and being curious if you can communicate with them and ask them what's going on um, in a way where you're not really assuming what's going on, but saying like, like what's going on in your mind right now? as simple as that. Something else that's really important is checking the facts. So one of the skills from DBT is called checking the facts. A lot of times we think our thoughts are facts. We just believe everything that's in our minds. So it's really important to question those things, um, especially when they're causing you to feel so strongly. So when you check the facts, you want to just describe what's happening factually, you know, thinking about what's actually happening. You know, I didn't get a text back and I, it's been an hour. Then start listing what your assumptions are. What are your interpretations about a situation? What are the assumptions that you're making? What are the thoughts that you're having? Um, and then you want to think like, well, what are the, all the other possible interpretations? And you can get silly with this. Like, you know, maybe their phone fell in the toilet. Or maybe they're busy, you know. <laughs> you know maybe yeah. they had a death in the family. Maybe... Like if they're at work, like maybe they got pulled into a meeting. I've had my husband push me to voicemail before and then he texts me back like an hour later and he's like, sorry, I got pulled into this like crazy meeting at work, you know? So I also like, I pay attention to some of those things so that the next time that happens, I can be like, oh, it's probably this thing. Yeah. It's very rarely that someone's actually ignoring me, like unless we've had it recently had a falling out, you know? It's usually that there's something else. So I try to keep track of those, which helps then in future checking the facts. It's like now I have a go to list of things. Exactly. I think that like when you're learning the skill, check the facts, it is really important to like try to like really do it more thoroughly, like really thinking about all these different interpretations. But eventually, like what you're saying, I think it just like becomes like second nature. Like you automatically start to think about all the different reasons why someone is doing something rather than like decide like your brain deciding on one specific thing and being like that is true and my thoughts are true and no, no one can tell me differently because I know and that is what hyper mentalizing is is being absolutely certain that you know what's going on with someone else and going on in someone else's mind my backup is to ask someone if they're okay 
because that the least threatening way to approach someone, even though I might not believe it in my emotions, I might think, oh, they hate me, whatever. I try to assume that there's probably something going on with them that I'm not aware of. I think that can be definitely useful unless you're doing it all the time, because that can be definitely someone does not want to hear, are you okay all the time? I would assume, at least that's my perspective. You can also just be like, hey, haven't heard from you. Like what's going on? But I I do think if you talk to someone every day, like if it's your favorite person, it's someone you talk to all the time. uh, Maybe it's not. Maybe you don't talk to your favorite person all the time. That makes a lot of sense. But if it is someone you talk to all the time, it might be harder because it's like I talk to them all the time and all of a sudden I'm not hearing from them. Um, That's, I think, when it's maybe good to like ask a question too. like what like isn't anything going on or like or like you there. Um, Something as simple as that. Now where I'm now in recovery, it's easier to think about these things. It's like, oh yeah, I say this. But if I think back, it's like, if I took that too far, I could be doing that all the time. And that would be just as problematic as all the other things, right? So it's 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 hard. It's it, it, There's a lot of like nuance to this. Yeah. I hear a lot of people talking about too, like asking someone like, are you mad at me? Like there's a lot of checking that goes on, like a lot of reassurance seeking. Um, and that comes from the fear of abandonment. Are you mad at me? Like assuming someone's mad at you, which is hypermentalizing, you know, be, like really feeling like it's true or they don't want to be around me. And then constantly asking, do you love me? Or like, do you really love me? Like, and I think a lot of that comes from yourself too. If you feel like you are unworthy or unlovable, it can feel impossible to feel like someone else actually loves you. But just like really trying your hardest to just accept that at face value. Unless someone is acting in a way where you feel like this is not love. A lot of people who I've spoken to with therapy, people talk about being in relationships with someone or having a friendship with someone who treats them not well, who, you know, maybe might even be like somewhat abusive towards them. And I think a lot of that comes from if you have a very low self-esteem or low feelings of self-worth, it might feel more comfortable for someone to treat you that way to treat you in a way that's like consistent with that. And it might feel even like weird or uncomfortable if someone's treating you really nicely. But really like recognizing that and taking that for face value is so important and being honest with yourself. Like this doesn't, if this doesn't feel good, if this doesn't make me feel good, just really being honest with yourself. And that's also where a lot of opposite action comes in, especially when you love someone. So an opposite action to love can be Like, you know, I talked earlier about like spending less time with them, not checking their social media or something like that. But in this case, it's like really separating yourself completely from someone, which is so difficult. Okay, so another thing that's really important is being able to express yourself clearly to another person. A lot of times when you are in a favorite person relationship, you might feel like your emotions are dysregulated a lot of the time, um, which makes communicating really difficult. And a lot of times when your emotions are so high, you might tend to do things like showing how you feel rather than telling how you feel, expressing yourself maybe through some sort of outburst or through maybe even hurting yourself um, and expressing that to someone. While it might feel like that's the most effective way to get someone to see your pain, Oftentimes it has maybe even like the opposite effect on the other person um, where they just become very concerned or scared or maybe even like upset with you for for doing something. The best way to communicate with someone how you feel is just by talking to them and telling them. And it might not feel as effective because you might be used to like being shut down by people when you say how you feel or not being believed, but really trying your best to just express how you feel verbally. There's like a number of ways to be interpersonally effective. And I think a lot of it is we talked about like making assumptions. So like thinking about the assumptions you're making in a situation and just really sticking to the facts when you're talking to someone. So let's say someone is doing something that's upsetting to you, or maybe you want someone to like, maybe show you a little bit more attention, or if they're not going to be able to get back to you for like a day or something to let to let you know I have a really busy day instead of just not answering, if that's something that's really important to you. I want to also balance that by saying that if someone doesn't give that to you, that's also something that it's more helpful to accept that than to try to control someone else. Communicating effectively, being able to say factually, like this is what happened or this is what happens based on the actual facts of the situation. And then saying, and this is how I feel. When you don't text me back for two days, 
I feel scared. And then maybe asking for what you want. Is it possible that, you know, you could just give me a heads up that you won't be able to talk for a few days before you just disappear? Um, you know, really just trying to stick to the facts, not being accusatory, just saying what happened and saying how you feel about it and then making an ask if you want to make an ask. Um, so that's something really important is really just communicating effectively too. And I don't know, Zanny, how, I don't know how you have felt in the past about communicating your feelings to people. Oh yeah. I mean, I absolutely used to act out in a lot of the ways that you described, like, showing people self-harm, like screaming, crying, begging, pleading, and learning to identify like my emotions and communicate those in a clear way was, I mean, it was really difficult, but uh, ultimately really effective. When your emotions are that intense, it's really hard to even figure out what you're feeling. And then that also kind of brings me back to this whole mentalization piece. When your emotions are so high, it's sometimes like, where is this? Is this emotion coming from me? Is it coming from them? Like, it, it can just be very confusing. You have no idea what you're feeling. You are just upset. You know, I am just dysregulated and I'm maybe even out of control. Um, that's something that's really then hard to communicate to someone. So again, I want to go back to, you know, the distress tolerance skills, doing something where you can like get yourself down. Um, and I didn't mention this earlier, but there is a skill in DBT called the stop skill, um, which is part of distress tolerance. And you really have to be very mindful. Uh, mindfulness is so important. So if, you know, if you haven't done any mindfulness, um, it's, you know, you can do mindfulness on your own. You don't necessarily have to be in a treatment program to like learn to be more mindful. Um, but part of mindfulness is paying attention on purpose to things. So being able to pay attention and label what's going on, I am starting to feel intense anger in my chest or whatever it might feel. Um, and then being like, okay, I am going to stop, stop sign here, <laughs> take a step back, maybe leave the room, not engage in conversation until you can calm yourself down, maybe engage in some of the tip skills, you know, using the water or breathing or even doing like intense exercise, doing like jumping jacks sometimes can be really helpful. And then when you are ready and you feel like you can identify what you're feeling and more mindfully figure out what's going on inside of you and what happened, then you can reapproach the situation and communicate. So important. Yeah, I mean, the mindfulness and stop skill were really big for me because I used to think that, like, my emotions just hit me out of nowhere for no reason. And I think a lot of that was because I I just wasn't really paying attention to myself unless an emotion was really out of control. So I didn't really notice the building because I just wasn't paying attention. And then when I started being more mindful, I started to notice, oh, I actually start getting upset way earlier than I think I do. I just haven't really been paying attention to it. Stop skill is a hard one. There are certain emotions that can feel so intense that you think about impulsivity. It's just like something just happens. It feels like it's so fast and automatic, but it's possible. It is possible. It takes a lot of mindfulness. It takes a lot of willingness. Um, to be like, okay, hold on. Especially if you're like in a conflict with someone else. Um, I know a lot of people like to feel like they want to be right, but just stopping yourself. And also if, you, if you're the type of person that is like more of like a fleer, someone who's going to just want to run away from a conversation, also stopping yourself. Let's say you're with someone and you're feeling like I can't, like I'm feeling like really overwhelmed right now. I feel like I need to run away. I'm going to like take my things and leave also stopping yourself and being like i need a second being able to express that like all right i need a second really asking to someone to respect that boundary because a lot of times people have someone in their lives that might not respect that boundary but if you can physically taking that space and saying i will be back in 10 minutes going and taking that space so what happens if then someone isn't able to give you, you ask someone for what you want you try to communicate something effectively, and they're not able to give you what you want, or they don't want to give you what you want. There's so much there that can feel so icky and painful and rejecting. You want someone to treat you a very specific way and they can't or won't. And there's a lot of control there that you need to let go of. And I think that's this is something that's hard for people to hear, that there's a need for control in a lot of ways, controlling how other people act so that we feel okay. And that's not necessarily fair to another person or fair to you. And it hurts relationships. So I think a big thing about that is, is completely accepting it. Um, in DBT, they talk about radical acceptance, which means like fully, completely, wholeheartedly accepting the reality of a situation, not accepting what you think about a situation, only like the facts.
facts of the situation. Let's say you ask someone, can you te- can you please let me know if you're not going to talk to me for a few days? And they say, I'm going to try my best, but I don't know if I can promise that because I don't like to use my phone so much and I'm just bad at answering. Like being able to fully radically accept that rather than being like, no, you have to do this for me because it's the only way I can manage my emotions. Being able to just like fully accept that. Or even if they don't, maybe they don't, the feelings aren't as reciprocated as you want them to be. They're not loving you as hard as you want them to love you. Radically accepting that. It can be painful to accept, but when you fight reality, that leads to suffering. You know, if you're in a destructive relationship where it's, you know, it can really hurt some some part of you, whether or not it's it's a physical type of hurt, um, maybe an emotional hurt, hurting your self-esteem, hurting your integrity, or even just like really preventing you from being happy in life. You might want to consider ending a relationship. You don't ever want to do this when your your emotions are super heightened, but when you are in a more clear-minded or what in DBT, what they call wise-minded place, um, where you have more of a clear head, where you're considering both your emotions and thinking more more reasonably and being able to think about that when you're calm and make a decision. Is this really like, is this destructive to me or is this interfering with my life? Ending relationships can be extremely painful and scary and difficult, especially if you rely on this person so much for like giving you a sense of self. Um, But again, I'm going to say willingness again. It's where it comes in and really like going back to the values and things that you want in your life. And is this how I want to be treated? Is this how I want to be living my life? And really considering that if you want to continue a relationship. And if you decide that you want to continue a relationship, if it's not, you know, destructive to you as a person, if it's maybe more interfering, you can, you know, go back to the skills I talked about managing the favorite person relationship, the skills about preventing a favorite person relationship, really trying to focus a little bit as much as you can more on yourself and doing things that you enjoy doing and not making your whole life about, about someone else. I think one of the most important things about what you've said about the ending relationships is not making the decision while you're in a heightened emotional state, because I've definitely had thoughts and moments like this. And I've seen this happen with other people where, especially early in recovery, we learn that it's important to stand up for ourselves and to set firm boundaries with people. But sometimes when we're in really intense emotional states, we'll make these decisions like, oh, you are hurting me. And so I'm out. Right. Yeah. And because I'm in pain in that moment, I've convinced myself that the relationship is unhealthy. And then I I either threaten to end it or I act like I'm ending it. And then the emotion subsides and I'm like, shit. I did not mean to do that. Right. And then that's extremely painful to them. It's like extremely painful and always making the relationship feel like it's always like we're walking on ice and you never know when it's actually going to fall through. The last part of the favorite person relationship I want to talk about managing is coping with the end of a relationship, the end of a favorite person relationship. I think this is probably for most people an extremely painful experience. As long as you're not completely devaluing them, meaning like seeing them as all bad, which can be a thing. It might be something that you experience. You might end favorite person relationships and be like, I never liked this person. Anyways, what did I ever see in them? Which might happen. It's protective. It protects you really against the pain of losing someone that has redeeming qualities, things that you really loved about them. It's easier just to say, never liked them anyways, what did I ever see in them? But when a relationship is really hard to get over and you feel like in so much pain, maybe it's taking years to get over a breakup or maybe even just longer than you would want it to and it's feeling more painful and it's causing maybe an uptick in symptoms, maybe causing more anxiety or depression. um, There's a number of things that you can do to get through this. It might not feel like it, but there are. So I think one of the most important things, we talked about radical acceptance before when talking about managing the relationship. But when a relationship ends, especially when you don't want it to, you have to fully accept it. If you're not fully accepting it, you are fighting against it. Maybe you are willing it to be back into experience. Like you're willing it to still be a relationship. You are maybe obsessing over it, ruminating over it. The best thing you can do is fully over and over again, keep accepting it. You know, if you keep telling yourself, if you don't want to like admit to yourself that this is really over and you keep trying to get it back or in your mind, staying so stuck on it, that's suffering. That is painful, long-term suffering. 
Yeah, radical acceptance is hard because I think it's so hard to not hear the word acceptance and think that you're thinking that this is okay. The analogy that I really like is radical acceptance is like being willing to recognize that like a thing you have is broken. Like if my coffee maker breaks and I'm just like, oh, it's not broken or it can't be broken or, you know, I can't live without this coffee machine. I'm not actually doing anything that allows me to change the situation. And, you know, I may not always be able to change it for the better, you know, but if I accept, yes, my coffee machine is broken, I can look at it and go, oh, you know what, this is too broken for me to fix it. Like I, I'm then able to solve the problem, right? I, I, I can't, move forwards or I end up being Mm -hmm. stuck in this place of suffering if I'm just unwilling to see that reality is reality. And, And with my biggest favorite person relationship, I was miserable and suicidal for two years. I like what you said about moving forward. Like, you know, instead of having to go buy a new coffee machine, it is this relationship is over. I no longer have them in my life. And I need to still move on and live. And like, it might not feel like you want to, or like you can. I know a lot of people talk about feeling like losing the favorite person feels like dying. Um, Or I feel like I'm going to die if I lose my favorite person. I've heard a lot. Mm -hmm. But the truth is you won't. And you get to make that decision, again, willingness to do something different, to accept what's going on and to make your life better from there and to prioritize yourself. I think one of the specific types of situations that can bring up like an extra layer of sort of guilt and shame about this is when a favorite person relationship ends and the favorite person is saying, I'm done because of your needy behavior or, you know, as a result, at least they are citing that it's a result of your BPD symptoms or your, your, how your symptoms show up in that relationship. And then either, you know, where they just cut off contact or ghost you or whatever. I mean, that was kind of how my romantic relationship ended. I mean, she didn't exactly ghost me. She said we were done, but then refused to respond to any communication. I, we were not allowed, I wasn't able to get any sort of closure or anything. And that was really hard because it adds this extra layer of, not having a resolution and then guilt and shame. And I'm I'm just wondering if you have any sort of specific tips that you would give someone in that kind of situation. Absolutely. I mean, shame is huge. Like everything I'm hearing as you're talking is just shame, shame, shame. So just recognizing that, first of all, that feeling the shame, it's normal. And it's also not something that you need to be stuck in forever. You can feel bad about something you did. Um, If you did something to hurt someone else in a relationship, you can feel bad about it. And you can also at the same time decide I'm going to do better because it's very self-compassionate to always want to better yourself. I'm, I'm going to do better either to this person or to someone else in a future relationship. So I'm going to always want to be the best for myself, but I'm not going to attack myself along the way because that only adds an extra layer of pain. You know, that is, I think the layer of pain that is the most difficult to get rid of. But once that's kind of like unlocked in a way, once you kind of remove that layer, it's much easier to deal with the things that are underneath it. So I would say a lot of it is really just showing yourself compassion. You know, you can feel bad about something, like genuinely feel bad about something. And it doesn't mean you have to like beat yourself up forever. And inside your head, you're being like, you're so horrible. How could you do that? Like you're the worst person in this entire earth. Like, yeah, maybe you did something that was terrible and you don't have to speak to yourself that way. Yeah, there's an element of separating your dysfunctional behavior from who you are as a person. I can say to myself, yeah, that was a really shitty thing for me to do. And that does not, that is not everything that I am. Absolutely. And you can do better. You know, we're always doing our best and we can do better. So that's important to keep in mind also. Other things that I think are really important for when a favorite person relationship has ended is doing things that are positive for yourself. So again, going back to the preventing a favorite person attachment from developing skills, accumulating positives, doing things for yourself that you enjoy, making sure that you are busy. Even if you you feel like you can't, that's also where opposite action comes in. Maybe you're feeling really depressed or super anxious and you just want to avoid or you just want to hide under your covers all day acting so opposite to that where you're going to be like, you know what, I'm going to get out, even just take a walk 
and be outside for a little bit today. You know, the sun is out. It's it's beautiful. I'm going to go take a 15 minute walk, even if it's something small, acting opposite, trying to see some beauty in this world, trying to do something for yourself. You know, if you're angry, if you feel angry at someone, maybe if you're devaluing someone, trying to act opposite to that, trying to understand maybe their perspective and maybe some envy is coming up if new if they're in a new relationship, you know, really just noticing that and and not trying to, you know, maybe you might want to sabotage a new relationship that they might have, trying to, you know, take a step back and not do that. Um, so just a lot of a lot of opposite action is needed. A lot of willingness is needed. And again, a lot of self-compassion because there's so much pain in the end of a re any relationship. And when it's so intense to the point where someone's your favorite person, you can only imagine how much more painful that is. So you deserve all the compassion for that. Thank you everyone so much for watching. We hope you got a nugget of wisdom to take with you on your journey. Thank you, Alex, for sharing all of your wisdom. It was really informative. Make sure to like, subscribe, and turn on your notifications so that you do not miss a single episode. And we will be back on Wednesday with a brand new topic. So we'll see you then. Bye.